I want to thank you so much for hanging in there where we had these technical difficulties. Joining me today is Brian and Carolyn from Frams Cams. Hello. 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 Hey, there. hey, how's everybody? Oh, my goodness. So we have had a, uh, a, a an eventful morning trying to get this thing up, but I appreciate everybody hanging in there. And uh, today we're going to be uh, talking. Brian and Carolyn are just going to be uh, co-hosting with me, and we're all just going to have a good morning. This isn't a, a formal interview or everybody uh, or anything, and I uh, want you guys to know that uh, this is interactive, so uh, feel free to be active in the chats, and we will talk about everything that's going on. Uh, there is a chance that we may hear from uh, Mark Schertz, who's teaching a class in Tanzania, Awesome. And if that happens and he shows up, uh, we're interrupting everything and we're going to be talking to Mark. So uh, just just be aware that there could be some uh, uh, some uh, unplanned things going on. That and cool. uh, yeah, he's uh, he's going out on a hike and wasn't sure exactly when he was going to be back. So we'll see. <laughs> so, All right. How are things going over there at Frams Cams? Good. 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 We were up feeding. I I was just putting in the uh, putting in the, the chat. We were chatting before you were able to come on. Just our basking schedule today because because it's getting a little colder here. So. 40, 40. Okay. so. Oh wow! Yeah. Wow! Yeah, it's pretty pretty, pretty early, but. Mm -hmm. It'll probably warm. All right. Again. Well, we're gonna be going into a bit of a. Uh, getting into the 90s again. So we're doing a little bit of a heat wave in California. So that'll be... Yeah, warm. <laughs> Got to deal with that. Six, like 60. Now, all right. Uh, question is, uh, how is the audio on your side? How is everybody hearing audio? Sounds great. It's great on your side? All right. Everybody in the chat, uh, are you hearing everybody uh, just fine? Just let me know. And so, as we know, uh, we are releasing the uh, latest uh, Chameleon Academy care summary today uh, for the Panther Chameleon. And these care summaries have, uh, uh, let's see, let's see. Give me a second here. here is, I, this is customer support now who... Apparently, I can't get rid of them. Okay, now the, now we're set. <laughs> so we are, okay, so we've got some problems with, uh, all right, we're going to have to hang in there with the uh, the audio. So, and uh, so this care summary is now out on the uh, chameleonacademy.com website, and it's a totally updated care summary. Uh, and so we're going to be going over that a little bit later. Um Okay, so let's see. In, in the chat, we're talking uh, the audio on your side seems choppy. Um, hmm. Let's see. My thanks. Yeah, I'm not sure. Although I'm not sure how to handle choppy software uh, or choppy audio on that side. Uh, so. Yeah, can you hear us? It's. Let's see. So go ahead and talk a little bit more. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. So, yeah. Okay, everybody. Sounds like there's a little bit of a lag. So we're just going to have to uh, adjust and be uh, uh, be understanding. So uh, okay. we'll, we'll ask a question and then I'll give you a little bit of time to respond. And it should, should. Oh, guys. All right. Um, Look at what we got. Hello, Dr. Mark Schertz. That's awesome. Hey. Well, uh, I told everybody that we were just going to um, interrupt everything if we heard from Tanzania. So uh, how about introduce yourself and what are you doing? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for interrupting. I, I haven't even seen what the what's going on on the screen. I don't know what I'm coming into. I just, just clicked. <laughs> the link, Bill. That's all I did. Exactly. 
<laughs> for those who don't know me, I'm uh, my name is uh, Dr. Mark A. Uh, paleontologist. I'm the curator of herpetology at the Natural History Museum in Denmark. Um, assistant professor of vertebrate zoology. It's a very long job title, but um, and I'm, uh, I'm teaching on a course where we're, we're doing um, basically techniques um, for ten. Tanzanian students. So it's uh, students from three different uh, Tanzanian universities all coming here to, to learn about um, surveying mammals, surveying herps, and especially entomology. So we have various experts from different institutions coming here, presenting a little bit about their work and about how to, how to do the basics of the methods, which is very easy here. And um, yeah, hopefully making a bit of a difference, which is now. How is it that you ended up teaching a class in Tanzania? Um, uh, that's a great question. I I uh, don't don't really know. So so the museum has Natural History Museum in Denmark um, has a long-standing collaboration with a very long-standing relationship. This, this research station that we're based at, um, financed by um, Italian institutions, but I think in 2000, uh, the Natural History Museum of Denmark became a partner on the project. So uh, frequently have groups, so there are even um, a couple weeks ago, a group of, of other professors, um, instructors from my institution were here teaching Danish students and Tanzanian uh, um, project, a joint joint teaching uh, endeavor, and, and um, this program is independent from that one. So this one is funded with um, money from the Iran EU based program um, to yeah build capacity in. Um, so Tanzania comes at the top of that list, and um, I as uh, originally another another um, person. Um, uh, um, Morten Allentoft was supposed to be doing this, but he wound up getting a job in um, uh, really impossible for him to carry it out. So I had to spring in, take over from him, and, and do it. <laughs> All right. So, what is Tanzania like right now? Dry as a bone. I um, so I should say I haven't been to mainland Africa about mm, 14 and that was south africa in the year before that was when i was five um so it's it's been i've i've been focusing on madagascar and um it's been somewhat shocking to come here dramatically different environment the dramatically different uh conditions especially for herping it, it's it's fundamentally different and of course what we usually so I, I usually time my season uh, in the wet season, sorry, and, and now I'm here in the dry, dry season. It is this is basically the driest. Um, when you get up to the top of the mountains, you can see all every field for miles around. Um, you might be able to see actually the mountain behind me if yeah. the light will. There you go. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. So I should say I'm at uh, Zungwa Mountains National Park of um, Tanzania. Tanzania, and we're not Malawi border. So, in terms of chameleon diversity, there's a whole bunch of um, chameleons that are found here. Some of which aren't particularly well known from here. So, for instance, um, Romensis uh, um, is is found here, but it I, I think even uh, omitted from some of the lists of species that are included here so it's um you know we know huge amounts about the chameleons of this particular area and and so far you know when i when I, i'm going to madagascar i find and reason it does it's very easy to find chameleons in madagascar and and um i've been here one chameleon um which i found by digging in the leaf litter looking so um, that was, of course, the uh, 
Repellion. It was Repellion, um, which is, uh, I think, species that used to be very common in the pet trade and is now essentially. Um, but uh, yeah, not, I mean, not the typical way that you find yeah. it. I mean, we did a hike. Essentially we, gone. We went. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, yeah, it's essentially gone. With Tanzania closing imports, it's very hard to find. Oops, I think we lost. Go ahead, try again. Uh, the... There we go. There we go. We heard you. Oh, he may not know that he's still on. <laughs> we're we're really stretching uh, this, trying to get uh, the internet in uh, in the middle of a Tanzanian mountain. But we're we're going to keep trying. Well, Mark, can you? Are you able to hear? Can can you hear? Let's see. I'll tell him we can hear you. Just keep talking. <laughs> Let's see if that message gets through to him. This, by the way, everybody, is the joys of doing a live session. It's a <laughs> lot. Of <laughs> oh, let's see. Oh, unfortunately, it doesn't look like um doesn't doesn't look like I'm able to. Let's see here. Wait, wait, wait. Can I... Talking right now. We can't. Okay, we can hear you. No, no, we can't hear him. Oh no, let's see. Okay, He's talking. Gosh. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Wish I had. I don't even have a writing an instrument that I can tell him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so right he's going to come back on. We're going to try this. <laughs> All right. We're going to wait. We're going to get keep going with what we're talking about and see if we can uh, bring him, get him back up. <laughs> and when it does, uh, we'll just jump over to him. Uh, so uh, anyway. We actually have a uh, a special feature here. Uh, oh, he's there back. He Let's see if we can hear. Ah, no. Ah. All right. So he's just going to try to join again. That's good. Um, yeah. Here, here, here we go. We have uh, some good. A good advice here. Need some flashcards for my show. Yeah. <laughs> Index work. cards and Index marker. cards, yeah. And a marker. Oh, all right. Well, I am going to... Let's see if he comes back. You know what we're going to do? Here we go. Mark, can you hear us now? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, there we yes. Go. Okay. Yep. Please, let's get back to telling us about the dry season and uh, where are all the chameleons? Uh, well, I don't know. Um, um, I have to deal with a situation like this, so it's uh, it's a bit challenging. So, so, so first of all, Bill... Uh, oh, no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we're... Oh no. <laughs> All right, guys. You know what we're going to do? We are going to uh, introduce you to a, uh, a a friend of ours uh, named Matisse. Anybody know who Matisse is? <laughs> we'll get you guys he up. He's in a full there. shed right now. All right. And you know what we're going to do? I'm going to pull up a, a video of our good buddy, Matisse. And we're going to... This is our Ankyphy Panther chameleon, Matisse. He is a four-year-old chameleon. He is probably one of our more internet-famous chameleons. 
Um, he has, he a, has lot a lot of followers. Of followers. It's, it's a lot, lot of love, love from everybody. everybody. So, so an Inkify Panther, Panther Million is from the Inkify region of Madagascar. And there aren't as many in the United States. We have a lot of Ambalobi, a lot of Nosy Bay, um, Yambanja, but Inkify is kind of creeping its way upward. There's a few breeders that work with Inkify chameleons, um, including ourselves. And Matisse has gotten his following just because of how absolutely magnificent he is. You can see that Inkify have these bright yellow and teal colors. Really, this dorsal crest that is all turquoise, all teal along the along the top is just a sign that he's an Inkify. When we got him as a baby, was like this ugly duckling. He looked like nothing. So we kept him around to see, oh, I wonder what he's going to look like. And it literally took probably until about a year and even a little bit longer for him to develop these colors. And wow, he has just turned into one of the most beautiful panther chameleons that we have here at Fram's Cams. I think that's kind of what made him a little different than other, even other Inkify panther chameleons, because he really was just yellow and turquoise and you'll be able to see those in those picture, colors in some of the pictures that we that we put up but Matisse is just this gentle giant that loves to strut his stuff for all the chameleons in the room um he performs on cue his colors are just amazing we absolutely love him Can you guys hear me? Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you very much. That was it's coming and going. It's... Oh, <laughs> we've got Mark. We can hear. We can hear you, Mark. Okay, Million. So, I we can see a rebellion. Yes. Can, can Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. okay. I, without. The video to see if this will uh, hold the Excellent connection. Excellent idea. Better. I'm on a, a mobile network. There's no Wi Fi out here. So, um, yeah, we'll have to see. So, Bill, Bill uh, you were asking about the dry season, the chameleons. Um, the, uh, uh, it's difficult to answer that question. I don't really know exactly where, where the chameleons are. Where we're based is at 300 meters above sea level so, so very low there should according to my, my expectations be at least um down here i would have expected camellio chameleon and also or at least one of those, those two um to occur in the more open areas etc and and i i haven't found a single one, which is because, you know, if you were to look for Fursifera Ustaleti, uh, which is also Madagascar, um, you'd find it no matter the season. So, um, yeah, a little bit baffled by the, the absence of chameleons down here. Um, here, I really, really would have expected to see at least some of the common species. You heard of what I said before, but... Um, that the repellion that I did find um, was frogs, and I happened to brush through a little bit of leaf litter and uh, moved in reaction to my turning it aside. So, um, and and that filter that I've got shown here. So um, that that's been that's been quite surprising. But you know, it's also because we're based at this low elevation where there isn't that great a diversity of chameleons. Um, most of the really, really interesting species only start above 600 meters above sea levels. You know, I, I would have to um, get a lot further up, but where are research really a, a feasibility to do on a regular basis. So um, at least I, I went on a very, very long hike. We went from, uh, we, we covered about 20 foot distance, one kilometer of elevation so we went from from here up roughly and then came back down um 
going through absolutely really incredible um but unfortunately you know it was close to a nine hour hike so um there was not a lot of time chameleons because chameleons during the day you have to search very thoroughly very systematically in order to really handing them especially if you're looking for repellian ramfolian um that would have required really stopping sift through the blue flitter to really to really catch them um in the same way that i would do for so unfortunately uh unsuccessful on that count but season so well so you are very close to the border correct relatively close to the border border with with malawi yeah are you in any uh in near any places where uh Melari would be um uh yes um i haven't seen any observations of mellers near where i am um that's not to say that they're not not here they just might not have been in list and whatever I, I can't remember if they're actually in the inventory for this park Okay. Um, I right. think that I had included them among the species that I was um, that are potential possibility that they would be here. Okay. But there's also tri um, you know, uh, several different uh, Ramfolian species and other Triocerus species. So, you know, there's a there is a good diversity, of not ideal conditions you know the the vast majority of chameleon surveys aliens has to be done at night um it's mm -hmm. just so much easier to find at night at, at least at the moment i haven't been doing, doing very much inside the actual park at night and what we have has been frog surveys because um that's really, really what we've been focusing on okay all right mark well Thank you very much for dropping by. Uh, you are absolutely welcome to hang out. Uh, we are talking about a wide variety of things, but if you've got data that you need to save, uh, we can let you go and uh, and save that data. Yeah, great. I will actually go do, do that. I have some snakes and things that I need. Um, but but uh, yeah, always, always, always happy to drop in and more success with finding other chameleons in the next few days i've still got two more weeks out here so okay that we'll, that we'll have more success all right well i'll, I'll keep in touch and uh, see how you're doing uh thank yeah. you very much for dropping on uh, dropping in and giving us a view of tanzania yeah my pleasure i'm sorry the video didn't work um but uh maybe maybe next time uh, that's the position. adventure of live yeah exactly <laughs> All right. All right. We'll see you, Mark. Bye. See you guys. Bye. Okay. Right at that point, did Matisse come out to make a uh, a I, showing? I oh, there he is. Alone shed. Look at that. <laughs> oh wow. Crazy. He's ready for Halloween. <laughs> yeah, he is. Oh, he, right. he just made a shot. And tried to grab her bracelet. Yeah. During that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> take that off. Quickly. I had to take that off real quick. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, we do have another feature here. Uh, one of the things, well, actually, let me ask you, how do you guys handle uh, misting or what is your hydration in your setup? Miss King, four total in this room. Um, we have a couple reservoirs big as 20 gallons on this side and then i have some five gallons um okay. for most of it running on one miss king all the way on the back wall all the way up and around the bus um and then i have other ones in between all right and then the mel parsons both have their own because i run them longer uh, um just for that okay we so fill, it's all mid we fill up a lot of water a day Oh, yeah. All right. Well, that leads into our next segment here, because the one thing about Miss King is 
the hardest, well, what would you think? What's the hardest part of setting up a Miss King? I think, I think it's hard for me because I've done it so many times, but yes, doing the, the, uh, the, um, what am I trying to say? The reservoir. The reservoir. Um, I've messed up um, many times leaking. Um, so you got to be careful. And especially if it's soft or harsh difference too. Um, the softer the plastic, I think the easier it works. If you get something that, like a five gallon bucket, sometimes there, there's no error. You can't have error or you're going to leak. Mm -hmm. and, get a few buckets. Uh, these buckets <laughs> you might need one or two you silicone now, now too i just once i do the whole i'll put, put some silicone around that seems to help a lot too and just let it dry for overnight before you start adding water and that's okay it. well uh that yes that is the most uh most intimidating part of setting up a mist king is uh putting together the reservoir and so uh, what we've done, uh, what we've done here is I've got a segment here that's going to talk about putting together the reservoir. So we're going to play this, and then we'll be back to talk about the um, the care sheet. Hello, Chameleon Wranglers. Today we're going to be talking about one aspect of setting up your misting system, and that's putting together your water reservoir. That's the, the bucket that's going to be holding all of the water. Now, many systems come with their own reservoir, but the highest end, the one that we mostly use, Mist King, does not. And that makes sense. Why pay for the shipping of shipping an empty bucket when you can go to Home Depot or your home improvement store and get one very cheap? And so what they do is they're gonna send you a bulkhead that allows you to uh, put a hole into a bucket and then uh, it, it's, well, it just allows the water to come out in a quarter inch tubing. And so today I'm gonna to go over that one roadblock that keeps a lot of people from using Miss King and that is setting up your reservoir. And so that's what we're gonna to do today. First thing you need to do is get a bucket, something to hold the water in. The flatter the sides, the better. But this bucket, I, I'm actually able to make work. We are able to get enough of a seal around this curvature that uh, your standard five gallon, yeah, this is a five gallon bucket. So your standard five gallon bucket from the home improvement store tends to work. So once you have your bucket, we're actually gonna have to drill that hole. And this is the best kind of bit to drill these holes. I am using a five eighths. Uh, the instructions say that a 9 16 can be used and that's a little bit smaller and that can be used if you, uh, you can use it on a plastic like this where you can really shove it through and you get a very tight fit. Uh, I use the 5 8 I don't need, I, I've been able to make it work without it being that tight of a fit. So let's go ahead and uh, drill our hole. Now when you drill your hole, you want to make it as close to the bottom as possible, but you do have to shove in this entire stem here. So I usually make it, uh, let's see, right about there. Now you're going to have to find in your Miss King package this bulkhead and this rubber ring. And what we're going to do is take off the end nut off of the bulkhead and we're going to shove this through that hole that we just drilled in our bucket. Once you put the bulkhead in, the o-ring and the nut, you're going to want to hand tighten it until it's pretty tight. After that, you get two wrenches. One's going to hold the nut on the uh, inside and one's going to be turning on the outside. And so you tighten it down very tight. Now, this is where it gets tricky because you don't want to go so far that you strip the nut. Luckily, Miss King is sending out a metal bulkhead, so that's not as easy to do as it used to be. When in doubt, stop tightening because all you have to do is fill the bucket with water and see if there's any linking. If there is, then you just tighten it a little bit more. Now, when you're doing the bucket fill test, you're going to want to find this piece here. Let's see if you can see this. Uh, this is going to be pl a plug and it's going to plug the outside here. Because you don't want the water to flow out the, uh, the bulkhead. Let's go ahead and fill the bucket and see how well I've done. So I'm thinking that looks pretty good. 
Now, Mist King includes a sediment filter, at least in uh, version 5. They have so many versions of this. And this is meant to be put inside the bucket, so it, uh, it makes sure that rocks and stuff don't get into the, uh, the misting system. Now, hopefully you're using just distilled water, and so there wouldn't be any sediment in there. But, since it's there, let's go ahead and put it in. And so, uh, we need to get the filter screw it on to the adapter then we just need this length of tubing put it in there i admit that there's a little bit of effort that goes into making this but it's worth it because the misking system is the best misting system that we have and all of these other misting systems that have come out just haven't matched the quality of the mist king yet now there is a company called Climus that does make systems that are comparable to the Mist King. And setting up a reservoir for the Climus system is exactly like it is for the Mist King. And so enjoy misting your chameleons. This is Bill Strand signing off and to you and your chameleons, happy misting. Sorry, gonna need, need to get the audio back on. <laughs> if I don't take the audio off, there's a horrible echo. Yep, yep. Okay, but, uh, I forgot about that. Like... <laughs> so, all right. So there is a tutorial about how to do the reservoir. Uh, I noticed we got a lot of some questions in the chat, and uh, Brian, Carolyn, you are asking, you are answering about breeding. Mm -hmm. Someone asked how many clutches Matisse has had. And I had many. many. <laughs> he he's beautiful, but he doesn't he doesn't like to breed. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, we uh we would love to see more Matisse's around. Mm, I know. I, oh. I think everybody would. All right, let's go ahead and bring up let's start talking about care summary. Uh I have I'm working on making uh, the care summaries for the Chameleon Academy, and I try to make them better every year. It's ending up being every two years because it's a lot of work to incrementally make it better. Uh, but uh, in this one, I just wanted to uh, announce, so it is available now on uh, the, the chameleonacademy.com website. And if you go to the profile, species profiles under uh, Pardalis, you're going to be able to see this. It's a download available for printing, for referencing. And uh, the, the special thing about it is, is it comes together with a website that gives you a detailed information about everything that's in here. And uh, this, this QR code down at the, uh, the bottom right, that is on the front page of uh, this uh, care summary. And so when you, if you print it out or you take it to, to a show, whatever you do, anybody can click that with their, their cell phone and they can get a detailed explanation about everything on these care summaries. And uh, let's see. And so the biggest difference about these care summaries is I've expanded them to include a, a section on breeding and a section on uh, medical. And this is a very brief, uh, a high level overview about medical, but it does give an idea of what kind of things that you can run into. And so it's a it's a good reference for beginners. And I wanna thank Brian and Carolyn because you'll notice that the uh, the, uh, the how to sex the babies is uh, comes from their photographs and from the interview that we did with them. So, uh, thank you, Brian and Carolyn. Carolyn, especially, that's her photos. Yeah, that, yeah. That's babies. <laughs> <laughs> I can. I know. I know. I just don't like to. <laughs> he's, he's always my second opinion. So, well, so uh, let's just go over a high level overview of, of care sheets in, uh, let's see. This is to do oh, okay. Uh, you know what? I'll go over how to use a care summary, uh, and then then we'll talk a little bit about how to use care summaries. For, uh, first of all, I uh, just want to let everybody know that this information is here for you all to use, uh, and it you can 
you can link to it on your website. Uh, you can take these care sheets and put them on your website, but just know that I do uh, I do update them on a, a regular basis. And that's one thing about the Chameleon Academy is if I'm not updating it every two years, then I'm slacking because our husbandry keeps moving forward, even if it's in, even if it's in small amounts. And so uh, not only, I it may not be that I am learning different numbers. It may be that I'm learning different ways of uh, presenting it because I get feedback from all of you as to uh, how well it's communicated. And if it's not communicated well, if there's confusion, I, I revise it. And so uh, this is part of me learning how to communicate all of this. But uh, you can uh, you can use it on a website. You can use it on your uh, your Facebook groups, your social media groups. Uh, if you have a vet office, you can print one out. Uh, you can uh, you can uh, use them in shows. Uh, really, you guys can use this however it serves you. Uh, the only thing is, don't don't change it. Uh, don't change the actual file. You can take all the information and put, use it somewhere else. I mean, the information is for the community. Uh, but if you've got my name on it, my graphics, don't change that. Because when you use this uh, care summary, it becomes a partnership between you and me, even though I don't know that you're doing this. But the fact is, if you're doing this, uh, I'm there to support you. And if somebody gets this and they have questions... Uh, yes, they will go to you because you are the breeder, and that is right. You should be their first line of contact. But if there's an esoteric something on this sheet of information that they have questions on, they may very well come to me and ask about UVB, how to implement UVB, because my name's on there. And so that's the the unspoken partnership I have with you is that I will be part of helping your uh, your customers. Um, now, uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you can use it. You can hand these things out at, at shows. You can have one master at a show and just have people, uh, scan the QR code because, you know, it, it's expensive to make the, uh, print these things out. Uh, but remember this is, this is really for the community. It's not just, it's not just me. Um, and uh, I also need to say that uh, care summaries are uh, starting points. Uh, this is very important that every care summary is not a end all be all of information. It is uh, just to give people who are starting out a place to start, a target to start. And after that, it's important that we all encourage them to look at what the chameleon is doing. Uh, I mean, I say that uh, the, the basking temperature is 85 degrees. That doesn't mean that every single person in the world should use 85 degrees. What I'm saying is that's a safe place to start off, 85 degrees, and then you see what your uh, chameleon is doing. Many of us, me uh, and, uh, and other breeders, are using 85 degrees. It's a very safe, hot uh, uh, basking spot. It's not going to burn your chameleon. But if your chameleon is telling you it's not warm enough, because if your ambient conditions are going to be di different, then you've got to listen to your chameleon. And so uh, all of these numbers, it's where you start off. And then you adjust depending upon what your chameleon is telling you. Um, oops, sorry. And actually, let, let's go back to that. Uh, Brian and Carolyn, uh, in your, you have a lot of panther chameleons. And they're all in the same room. Do you notice that different panther chameleons will will want different conditions, even just slightly? Yep. Definitely slightly. There's, you know, you know I more vis visible kind of with the basking temperatures and the, the length of time that the bask. But I am constantly just about on a daily basis watching, you know, on how many chameleons millions are basking still at 10 o'clock trying to kind of figure it out. um like i said earlier in the in the live adjusting that because our ambient temperatures are changing due to the temperatures out 
side changing. So, you know, what was an hour to a basking in the morning is session because the chameleons are not done basking at that point anymore because they're getting much, much cooler in our, in our room. Yeah. And every chameleon is an individual and there's no way to make one care sheet that's going to be for 100% of the environments out there, 100% of the chameleons out there and the cages out there. It's just not impossible. And so uh, all we can do is make starting points. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so hey, we have a, a question. How would you be able to tell if it's too cold for a chameleon? Uh, they, they they don't go gravid if you if it's too cold, but uh, so how do you determine whether it's uh, too cold? Um, chameleons will get dark when when they're they're colder. Kind of you know, and I was just actually talking to my third graders about this the other day. Like when you're wearing in the sun, you're going to be hotter than somebody that's wearing, you know lighter colors in the sun so the those will darken up and and soak up those rays so you can definitely tell alien is is colder just based on on those those colors that they're showing and what do you personally do as far as uh, uh if you see a chameleon is cold uh do you up the temperature of the basking or do you increase the amount of time that they bask it can be a combination both. Of both. Um, I, I definitely, Brian, and make sure our, our lights are in the correct places in the cage. I just, just did that this morning. You know, a certain, you know, depth from the top of the cage, the, the, per, uh, the back. We change our cages. Those areas have, have to change, too. So, um, too. so yeah. we can actually turn yeah. them up rather than changing the, the wattage. We can dimmer mm -hmm. on the uh, the fixture, and that way we can, can, you know, whoever wants a little. Um, you know, this whole row back here are all amblobies, so they're all pretty much seem, seem like they like that same bays are on this side, and then my ankyphi and ambondas are on the other side. So I'm trying to keep them because I know some of them, you know, like different temps. Okay. All right. So, it, yeah. So uh, that is an example of how, you know, every chameleon is an individual. So conflicting advice. You will find many different care sheets out there. And how do you know? I mean, this is a, 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 a question. Not sure there's an answer. A uh, good answer, but how do you know the difference between a care summary that is just old information, a care summary that's just wrong, and a care summary that's just another way of doing it? And uh, it, it's not necessarily obvious, especially when you're starting out. When you are in the position where you really need that information, you don't know what sources you should be listening to or what to do with all this conflicting advice. And for that, the best way to do it is to uh, investigate the origin of the care sheet and decide on who is going to be the most reliable that you think has the best information. And then just listen to that one person to get yourself set up and worry about all the other information uh, later when you have every, uh, have everything set up and you know, everything's working. Uh, because you don't, and you don't have to take sides. You don't have to say, okay, I chose this and this is the one right way of doing it and, and reject everything else out there. It could be that there's five different ways that work because all of these care summaries are, are a combination of humidities and, uh, and techniques and temperatures and all of them have been found to work together. So there could be different ways uh, that work. You just have to pick one and don't don't uh, pick and choose between the different methods because then your chameleon will have no idea what's going on. Uh, and I will say that all uh, so many of the fights on the internet that you see and a lot of the drama over all of these numbers and such 
comes from a mindset that these are hard set in stone numbers. If you view a care summary, a care sheet, as this is what I am saying is the only way to do it, is the best way to do it, then, then that's where you get the fights. The healthy way to look at a care summary is this is a good starting point. And from this starting point, we are going to build from this. And uh, and then you can wrap your mind around it's okay to have different starting points. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and Brian, Carolyn, uh, I, I know you, uh, you work with uh, the Chameleon Academy care summaries uh, a bit. Is that correct? We do, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we definitely use um, the room. It works for us. You know, obviously there's, there's different tweaks because environment might, is obviously different than a lot of people's environments. So the you know, observation of your chameleon and, and like you said, those starting points, I, I think. And, and, you know, we've had over the years many customers or just people questions about different advice, conflicting advice. And, you know, Brian said that there is absolutely not one way to care for your, your chameleon. There's different ways that people do it. And it absolutely is great advice, Bill, that, you know, the breeder that you're going with, because then that person is always there to answer questions. And, and that conflicting advice comes in and we've even had you know people to ask us questions and saying well you know so and so says i should be doing this and be doing this and those things may work but what we're going to tell you is and help you know that person kind of you know tweak that for their own environment so there it, it's just yeah it's important and to realize that there isn't one there are good ways to go about figuring it out for your own room yeah and i'll say the person you want to listen to when you're starting off is your breeder and mm -hmm. and i'll say that if you take the chameleon academy care summary you're going through all of this and your breeder says something different do what your breeder says it's okay. I'm okay with that. It's because your breeder is the one who is there handholding you and is talking to you and is uh, getting feedback about your situation and is making decisions based on their experience with what they know about your situation. Uh, so go with them. And what you're looking for when you're starting is a consistent source of information. The worst thing you can do is ask a question on five different Facebook groups and just select one randomly. Yeah. And then yeah. now you have your temperature and then you go and you ask five random Facebook groups for for UVB advice. Uh, you can't pick and choose that way. You, you'll just go crazy doing mm -hmm. that. Pick a reliable source, a reputable source that you feel good with and just go with that source. Um, it, it, it doesn't mean that you're saying everybody else is wrong. It's just saying that you are going to focus until you've got your feet under you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, all right. So in this, uh, actually we don't need to go over specific changes. Uh, well, one thing I did want to say is in, uh, I've, what I'm changing on these care summaries is with my cage size. I go with the minimum cage size, and that's been the two by two by four and the 36 inch by 18 inch by 36. That hasn't changed. But I, I wanted to give a target. And I have, and I always said four foot by four foot, uh, four foot by two foot by four foot, which is great. It's great. But I wanted to change that up because I definitely went four by two by four because that's what's commercially available. Uh, and mm -hmm. I thought that I would be able to give a little bit more good advice by with this target is if you're going to be building uh, your own chameleon cage. Once you're doing your own chameleon cage, you are not 
stuck with what we can manufacture. Uh, all of the dimensions of what we manufacture have so many different aspects that go into what they're going to be other than what's good for the chameleon. It's what size of the PVC sheets come in, how do we ship it, and all of that kind of stuff. That, that's just reality. So what I wanted to do with this target is saying, if you're able to build your own cage, at, at least start with this. That's why I have R greater. It's always R greater. And so uh, that I just wanted to explain what that target, uh, that new part to the cage size is. And, and then, yeah, I added on uh, <laughs> branch diameter. Just seemed mm -hmm. like a, a nice, good reference. Uh, and you'll notice whenever I update these, I always have different, little different reference things that I'm throwing in. Uh, I love that. <laughs> uh, on the temperature, I went ahead with the basking and I I'm keeping it at 85. Uh, I used to have 85 to 90, but I I'm going to say just start with 85. This is supposed to be a starting point. That is a safe place to start off. Uh, and, and I'm suggesting not going above that until your chameleon says they need it and then do it. Uh, the, the UVB, I, I added one more level of complexity because I, I, I just, I think I simplified it too much. Uh, there is, I'm giving two dimensions, uh, two distances. One is for the UVB above the cage and the other is from the top of the cage to the back of the chameleon. And what this does is it acknowledges that the UVB coming off of our bulbs, whether 6%, 12%, even the 5.0, it's too high for chameleons. And so uh, I know you see a lot of um, people out there saying you just put the UVB on the top of the cage. And what that does is it gives you a couple of inches, two to six inches, depending on what bulb you're using, of UVB that is too high for the chameleon. And so I realize it's a complexity, but I'm going to include it in there anyways, because I've got to be true to that. It's a, it's a real, it's a real issue. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then there's, uh, I added on something about feeding. So, um, like whew. the graphic of how happy, I think that's, that's good. <laughs> Yeah. So, well, uh, and I want to ask you about your feeding. Uh, would you, how, how much do you feed your adults? Um, about every other day, but I only give them three to four bugs now. Once in a while, I'll throw them a treat, give them okay. a super warm or two. Um, but we've cut it way. We overfeed like everybody. Everybody oh, yeah. wants yeah. to see a chameleon eat. Um, three to four bugs every other day, and then maybe twice a week I'll give them like one or two silkworms, depending. Worm once in a while, I give them a couple silkworms here and there. Yeah, but and our females, they get more food obviously than yeah than the males do. They just have to take more in. They have lots of things going on, so <laughs> it's important. <laughs> All right. Well, we've got uh, a couple of very good questions here, and uh, I, I like this one. This is a good one for uh, for you, Brian and Carolyn. How do you know when a uh, chameleon is ready to go to a new home? Community that that three months old is <laughs> typically what you know is. Um, however, with that said, when we see a community because there's always going to be some that are bigger in a clutch and some that are smaller in a clutch. So you might get some that are big, bigger um, feeders. And that's typically when we'll say that we want, want them to be able to, I want our customers to be able to find appropriate size to see place. So, you know, if people are buying their, their feeders at the local pet store and, you know, going online, and, and ordering, they, they they need to be able to find something available. And usually that's a, you know, like a three eighth inch to a, a half inch. And, you know, that's typically I want to see well. that they're eating out. really well too, like mm -hmm. they're chasing bugs. You know, when they're little, 
they don't do that quite as much. Um, you know, I, you know, obviously coloring up, um, you know, that three to four month is more happy at, um, nosy bays take longer. So we usually hold those like mm-hmm. one extra month. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but yeah, I want to make sure they're really like going after their food really. And, uh, they're kind of like ready to go to that next place where I feel comfortable. Yeah. All right. We have a question here. Our comment uh, from Jenny uh, mentioning that I have a different viewpoint than most German com- keepers, especially with the fogging. And uh, this is a big thing. Uh, there are many very strong opinions, especially around fogging. Uh, I've, <laughs> I think the, uh, the biggest uh, points of contention in chameleon husbandry are around uh, hydration and UVB. Um, Mm-hmm. UVB shouldn't shouldn't be that that that's a very strange political thing, but uh, I mean that's just numbers. But when it comes to hydration, I, I think what really muddies the waters is uh, people have such different uh, uh, environments that they're in. Uh, someone in Arizona that's having a single digit humidity on a, uh, a common basis. Uh, getting online and starting to talk to somebody in the UK who gets fog rolling in all the time, they're going to have different experiences with foggers, misters, hydration. And we tend to build up that, that approach that we have lived for decades and we know is absolutely true. And, uh, but the thing is we've got two, 100% 100% true things that are contradictory because of the uh, environment of which they were true. And we don't talk about context when we get on the internet and decide we hate people. So uh, what I'm hoping to do with the Chameleon Academy is explain the reasons behind it. And and that way you can adjust it to your situation. And in this particular case with fogging, uh, I, I don't I don't want to say that everybody has to fog. What I want to say is we need a certain humidity in the evening and then during the night, and you figure out how to achieve that depending upon your situation uh, and your environment. And there are times when I don't fog because I have I actually have humidity. There's a couple of days like that here in California. Uh, but in the vast majority of the time, I do have to fog. Now, there is some controversy over the way to get that humidity. And I will admit, I don't, uh, I, I'm not deep into uh, particle size. Uh, as for the particle size, whether you want a nebulizer or a fogger or a mister and uh, what the health implications are, because I haven't seen any problems using a fogger or a nebulizer or such. Uh, and so I think it's a, a murky area, but uh, there's definitely some very strong opinions out there. And like I said, just just assume, just go ahead, take in all of those strong opinions, and uh, realize what's at the core is you're trying to create an environment. And mm-hmm. we we can we can all uh, complain about and uh, and argue about how best to get that environment. But I think I've done my job when you understand what the environment is you want to target. Oh, uh, all right. I'm going to catch up on some of the, um, to do. Okay. There's some discussions going on in the chat. Uh, well, Barton and Carolyn, I want to ask when it comes to you sell a chameleon, how do you deal with there being, uh, different, uh, different opinions? Say, I don't know. Is there anything on my care summaries that you do differently? Um, there really, I think we are always keep, keeping the differences in our at the forefront of, of the needs of our, our customers that are, you know, putting their, their, their homes. Um, you know, I, I tend to think about it. If we were taking it in our, in our house upstairs, what would I suggest? Um, because it would be different than what we do. Um, but I think that, that you know, the starting great, great, 
And, you know, we have like for UVB, we're using it. It's, it's easier for us with that instrument to see where our better, where mm -hmm. the, you know, the heights of things need to be. But, you, you know, people aren't going to be able to go out and buy a solar meter. So, so you know, it's, you want to if it's a certain brand and and maybe target a year if it's another brand um things that we keep in mind when we're when we're talking with with our customers about about you know asking them like what are the temps of your home what are what are the humidity levels form does it get during the you know it's very easy for us to keep the humidity up in here because mm -hmm. in this room right we understand when you're doing it maybe upstairs in like a bedroom or a living more challenging mm -hmm. um where they might have to miss even more than we do just to you know or or use the fogger which i think is a great you know tool for keeping fogger and it's out in the other room mm -hmm. uh, um only because you know if Rennie was but because he's in a drier part we turn the fogger on for a few hours at okay. night mm -hmm. a little bit but in this room we can get it up to 80 percent some nights um, mm -hmm. um but it's more challenging for us in the winter when it dries up we have to we kick on the misting system in it per cycle during the winter yeah all right so alicia uh you do an extra mist system uh mist session at night if you don't have a fogger uh, and you can do that. Uh, misting will increase the humidity of your cage. Uh, the reason why a fogger is nice is because it will increase the humidity of the cage without using a lot of water to do that. Because with a mister, yes, you get a great mist and it coats the surface of the cage. But after, a, after the first coating and such, you're starting to use a lot of water. And it just... Mm -hmm. It just drains out and it's essentially it's wasted. Uh, so it, it yes, the question is it, the answer is yes, you could do an extra mist session at night. And uh, depending upon your environment, that tells you how many times you got to do that. Um, and have Colts asking fogger at night between midnight and 5 a.m. for a starting point. Yeah, uh, it's yeah, a good that's starting good. point. That's that's pretty much what I do. I think on the uh, care summary I have from one o'clock to six o'clock, it, it's, it's, it's not an exact number. And that's the one thing, everybody, if you're looking at this care summary, do not look at my sample. Uh, I, I have a graphic there that tells about the, the, when the lights come on and when you do the misting and the fogging and the dripping and, and the basking and all of that, that is just a sample. Don't, don't get a magnifying glass out and see exactly when the start time is and exactly when the end time is. Please understand <laughs> the strategy that, that that is trying to communicate and use that strategy. So, uh, you know, I, I have to put down something specific so it actually communicates something, but it, it's not meant to be a rigid black and white thing. Um, right. What is your opinion on bioactive chameleon enclosures? We've done it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm totally fine with it. We don't do it in our room only because of how much cleaning I have to do. Mm -hmm. um, but we've done them. I like them. I like, like them a lot, actually. Uh, um, but for what and how we're doing things, uh, well, maybe it wouldn't make more work. But it would be a lot more work for me to do out of cages. I have yes. um, so very, very easy for me just to go. That's why I raise the cages up a little. Um, but no, I'm for it. I I think it looks great. I think it's good. Mm -hmm. uh, me personally, I am loving it, and I love doing it, and I love raising up babies. Uh, so I, I think uh, we're going to see more and more uh, bioactive uh, working with chameleons, especially raising babies. Uh, now, yeah, it does get a little bit, um, it becomes a lot of a, pro a big project when you're doing 30, 30 babies in 30 yeah. separate cages. But uh, I think, uh, generally speaking, we're learning more and more about the benefits. 
Uh, the big let's see. We... All right. We have Liam's asking, is there a temperature range that the fogger should be run between? Generally, I, if you need humidity, you that's when you run the fogger. Uh, you uh, on the internet, you are told that you don't run the fogger with the lights on. What that is saying is don't create a sauna. And and you guys got to understand when when you hear things on Facebook, everything on Facebook is reduced to its absolute most simplistic form. And there's so much detail that goes behind that to explain it. Uh, so it's put into its simplistic form so it's easy to communicate and to, especially when you're talking to uh, a beginner, you need to make it simple or else they just, their brains explode. So what that, the reason why you are told not to a fog when the lights are on is because often when the lights are on, there's heat and you, you put heat and humidity, you create a sauna that that's not necessarily the right conditions. But uh, when you get down, when you get down below the sound bite, the fogger is there to create humidity. And if you have single digit humidity, uh, I, I, I recommend you put on the fogger and get some humidity in there. So you're not going to create a, sa a sauna. Like when I had Santa Ana winds come through here and my humidity went down to 6%, I can guarantee you I was not creating a sauna by, cre uh, by putting the fogger on. I was creating, bringing humidity up to where my chameleon wouldn't suffer. So uh, that is a way of saying that what you are told about not putting foggers on during the day, there is an element of truth to that. But when you get down a little bit deeper, you realize there's a, it's a lot more nuanced than that. So uh, that's that's what I will say on that. It, it's a huge subject. So <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is you, it, it seems to be contradictory, but when you dig down, it really isn't. That's and I'd say that's probably ninety percent of the internet fights we have is yeah. where <laughs> you have two truths that are that are just the the aspect of the same the same truth so two two as two facets of the same truth and they fight ad nauseum because yeah they're both true you can't prove them wrong <laughs> uh, so let's see a thought fogging was also to help with the chameleon's hydration uh yes uh when you have a humid environment your chameleon will not dehydrate as much because they're not losing moisture. Now, if you uh, listen to Peter Nechas, he's done some experiments where he he is showing that chameleons actually gain weight after a night of fogging. And so uh, he's saying there's a positive hydration attached to fogging. Uh, I don't go that far because uh, I am not comfortable in my ability to communicate that to people using my care summaries, uh, I if I put on my care summaries only fog during the night, I'm not confident that I wouldn't create havoc out there with people trying to recreate that successfully. So just because my care summary doesn't list that doesn't mean it's not true. Doesn't mean I don't believe it. Things on my care summary are things that I am confident I can explain in a infographic graphic to where people are going to be successful. So once again, <laughs> you dig down and there is so many, so many details and nuances to all of this. So, um, all right, we are, we are coming to the end of uh, of our, our show here. We've gone over, but that's okay because I started late. Thank you everybody for hanging tight and being understanding about this, this wonderful technology, Brian and Carolyn, any last words of wisdom for the world? No, just <laughs> thanks for uh, uh, having us on. Yeah. We really appreciate you know, getting to talk to you about your care sheets. 
is just, you know, something we enjoy doing because we believe we Every appreciate day. the time that it takes you to do them and um, the how much of work. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, <laughs> and I'm glad you're using them. And I, I it's just great being like, partnered with people. Or what was that? We've been using them. I mean, we, we put them in our, with our box, um, obviously with your name all over it and, and it's worked for us. So we're not changing. I mean, like I said, we change our temperatures are different than yours, obviously. And, um, but for the most part, it's, you know, I, that's where we like to be 85 mm -hmm. is where we like to keep it at. And, you know, no, it works. Okay. And uh, any any breeders out there, if you want to use my care summaries, but there's something about it that you would rather do differently, say you say you want to do a different basking temperature, you are uh first of all, let me know that you're doing that. Let me know that hey Bill. I am using your care summaries. I'm giving them to my customers who get my chameleons, but I'm also telling them that I prefer a higher backing temperature, uh, more misting sessions. You tell me what that little tweak is that you want is different. And then I will know that if somebody comes to me and says, yeah, but my breeder says that I should have a higher number, then I know what's going on. Because really, I want to support all of you breeders uh, because essentially you breeders are the cornerstone of our community. Uh, everything that I do with the chameleon community, the 150 pages that I've got in a podcast and a live show every week, I am producing tons of content, but none of that makes any difference if you, uh, all the people uh, enjoying my content can't get a hold of good chameleons. Uh, so without the breeders, there's nobody to do anything with the information I produce. So I want to support you as the breeding community. Um, I understand that some of the things I say about husbandry are in direct conflict with the number of breeders and uh, not every breeder is happy with me. But uh, if you as a breeder want to use my care summaries, you believe in it, you say, yeah, this is good for my customers, then I'm going to work with you and mm -hmm. let me know if there's something you disagree with and that you tell your customers here, you can use this care summary, but I disagree with this one aspect. And if they come back to me, at least I know the context. And I will say, yes, that is a disagreement. There is a reason why I have 85 degrees and why your breeder has told you 90 degrees. And it's not that one of us is wrong. It's he is, your breeder is very specific and my care summaries have to be general. And I will explain that to anybody who comes to me. So if you, you can work with me, I will work with you. Uh, if you want to say, if you want to justify and say that uh, uh, you can raise babies as a group, then we have a problem. I will say, no, nah, I can't. I can't do that. So there are limits to what I can uh, fudge. But uh, talk to me. Talk to me. Let's let's work things out. So, all right. In that case, uh, I'm saying hello. Uh, just taking a look at everything in the chat. Seems like there's a lot going on there, and we will. Uh, but we're, we're going to uh, close it off here and get back to our lives and uh, back to our wonderful internets. Uh, Brian and Carolyn, where can people find you and Framscams? Framscams.com. Uh, mm -hmm. That's our website. Book. We do, do have a new Instagram again. Um, yeah. Fram you know what? <laughs> I got to respect. You guys just love the game. You, know, you, you keep yeah. You, you 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 win you run across the finish line you close down your account and you start over because it's fun yep yeah That's why we're doing it <laughs> it's yeah. a challenge it's, yeah. it's a challenge we love but uh yeah find us at framscams underscore chameleons underscore backup right now yeah all right in that case everybody um want you uh, to encourage you if you'd like to get on my the a newsletter at the end of every week I send out a news, an email newsletter that gives you a summary of everything that's gone on during the week. It's got links to whatever videos I put out. And so if you want a, a nice summary to make sure you didn't miss anything, 
uh, just sign up for the newsletter. You go to the chameleonacademy.com homepage, scroll down to where it says sign up for the newsletter, sign up for it, and you'll get something generally every Sunday night. And uh, that that's just a touch point. So, uh, all right, everybody. Thanks, Thank Mel. you very much. Bye. And uh, we'll see you all later. Bye.